sadistic, psychotic, sick, and evil. These words and more are frequently used to describe the people that staffed the concentration camp system in the Second World War. And yet, all of them started out as perfectly normal people with normal lives and normal jobs. But these were unprecedented times, and if history has shown us anything, it's that it does not take much for normal people to become amongst the most feared monsters. Today, Descent into Darkness takes another look at the worst Nazi camp guards. Part 2 Hertha Botha, a.k.a. the sadist of Stutthof. Camps active, Ravensbrück, Stutthof, Romberg-Ost, and Bergen-Belsen. Beginning with the gentlemanly thing of ladies first, Hertha Botha was born in early January 1921 in the town of Tetarov in the region of Pomerania. Her father was a carpenter, and a young Hertha would often help her father in his little workshop. As she grew older, she took a job in a local factory, but this would not last long. She quickly opted instead for nursing. By 1939, the 18-year-old Hertha decided to join the League of German Girls, the female equivalent of the Hitler Youth, a political indoctrination cult masquerading as a pseudo-Boy Scout association. From here, Hertha was recruited into the concentration camp system as an overseer. In September 1942, she was placed at the Ravensbrück camp, used exclusively to house female prisoners. Here, she would complete a month of training before being sent on to the Stutthof camp. At 6 foot 3 or 1.91 metres, Hertha cut quite the imposing and naturally domineering character. She is known for regularly pistol-whipping prisoners under her. This led to her acquiring the nickname, the Sadist of Stutthof. From here, Botha was part of the guard of one of the infamous forced death marches in January of 1945, evacuating the remaining prisoners from the most easterly camps from the rapidly advancing Red Army. During one of these marches, she would temporarily stop at Auschwitz on her way back to Germany, and then to Bergen-Belsen, which was reached at the end of February. Many thousands more prisoners had died on the road. Those that made it the whole journey were, by now, close to death. Bergen-Belsen was liberated by the British on the 15th of April 1945. Botha was part of the camp staff that was forced at gunpoint to move the many scattered corpses and bury them in a mass grave that they were also forced to dig. Typhus had become rampant in Belsen by this point, and Botha herself spoke of being terrified of catching the disease herself as she moved and manhandled the dead bodies. Botha would be put on trial for her crimes, and, as one would expect, she attempted to minimise her involvement. She was adamant that she never beat any prisoners with any implements, although she did admit occasionally striking them with her hands. This was greatly at odds with witnesses who claimed that they had seen her on multiple occasions using a whip or a cane repeatedly to beat people, and one time using a wooden block on a Hungarian Jewish woman's face named Eva, smashing her skull and killing her. Another stated that she summarily shot two prisoners on a whim, Bota was convicted for her part in the Holocaust and sentenced to ten years' imprisonment. However, she was released in late December 1951. In an interview recorded in 1999, Bota, when asked if she considered now that becoming a guard was a mistake, she defensively replied, Did I make a mistake? No. The mistake was that it was a concentration camp, but I had to go to it. Otherwise, I would have been put in there myself. That was my mistake. Hertha Bota died on the 16th of March 2000, at the age of 79. Hermina Braunsteiner, a.k.a. the Mayor of Maidenek. Camps active, Ravensbrück and Maidenek. Born in Austria on the 16th of July 1919, Hermina was the youngest child of a strict Catholic family. Her father, Friedrich, worked as a chauffeur, but sadly did not earn a great deal of money. This meant that little Hermina was unable to afford the tuition to train as a nurse, 
and so had to content herself by working as a maid. She ended up working in England for a year as a maid to an American engineer based over there. When the Anschluss was declared, uniting Germany and Austria, Hermina automatically gained German citizenship. In 1938, she decided to move to Berlin, gaining employment at the Heinkel Aircraft Factory, which was gearing up in preparation for war as part of the rearmament, which was against the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, but by this point, no other country dared stand up to Germany for their violation of the rules in the much maligned policy of appeasement. In early to mid-1939, on the advice of a friend in the local police, she decided to apply for a job with the SS as an overseer in the concentration camp system. This greatly boosted her income, and in August of that year, she began training at Ravensbrück. Here she would be under the tuition of another infamous female guard, Maria Mandel, who was covered in part one. Clearly, Mandel's sadistic side rubbed off on Braunsteiner. However, after three years at Ravensbrück, she had a falling out with Mandel, which led to her requesting a transfer to a different camp. This was granted, and Braunsteiner was sent to Poland to the camp at Meidnek in October of 1942. By this time, Aktion Reinhard, the extermination program, had been approved and had begun to be rolled out across six camps, Meidnek, just outside of Lublin, being one of them. At Meidnek, Braunsteiner was keen to be involved in selections, sending those unable to work to the gas chambers. She was witnessed on several occasions gleefully beating inmates to death, stomping on them with her jackboots. It was this behaviour that earned her the nickname of Stutter, the mare. She was also regularly seen grabbing small children by the hair and throwing them into the trucks headed for the gas chambers. She was so highly regarded by her commanders that she was awarded the War Merit Cross second class. With the advance of the Red Army, Meidnek was ordered to be liquidated, although the man left in charge to oversee this task, Anton Ternas, clearly didn't give a damn at this point or was just completely incompetent, failing to destroy the gas chambers, meaning that we still have one intact to this day, the walls still streaked with the deep blue residue of the Zyklon B gas. Braunsteiner was recalled to Ravensbrück, where she continued her sadism, regularly thrashing inmates with the riding crop she was rarely seen without. Following the war, she was arrested by the authorities in Austria and put on trial in Graz. She was convicted for crimes against human dignity for her treatment of prisoners at Ravensbrück, but a lack of witnesses at the time meant that she was reluctantly acquitted for her crimes at Meidnek. She was sentenced to three years and all of her property was deigned forfeit. She was released in 1950 and struggled to find a decently paid job, but fate would hand her an undeserved lifeline in the form of, of an American man named Russell Ryan, who met her in Vienna whilst he was on holiday. He instantly took a shine to her, and the two struck up a relationship. The two were married in late 1958 and emigrated to Nova Scotia in Canada. In early 1959, the couple decided to move south to the USA, eventually settling in the New York borough of Queens in 1963, gaining her US citizenship in the process. However, on the other side of the world, in a Tel Aviv restaurant, a small group of survivors from Meidnek had gathered around the table to talk to famous Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal. They were there to tell him about the crimes of Hermina Braunsteiner, and that he should try to bring her to justice. Clearly, the plight of the survivors had moved Wiesenthal sufficiently to open investigations into the whereabouts of Braunsteiner. He had picked up on the scent of her trail, her marriage to Russell Ryan, and tracing her to New York. He approached the New York Times in 1964, and told them of a potential presence of a wanted Nazi criminal residing in the Big Apple. The paper assigned a young journalist named Joseph Lelleveld to track down the Ryan family. The Ryans were tracked down to 72nd Street in the Maspeth area of Queens. Lelleveld knocked on the door. Hermina answered, and, realising that the day of reckoning had come, said, My God, I knew this would happen. You have come. Russell vociferously defended his wife, as one would expect, saying, there is no more decent person on this earth. She told me this was a duty she had to perform. It was a conscriptive service. 
Clearly, his wife had been more than a little conservative with the truth, painting herself in a far better light than reality would suggest. The US government attempted to rescind Braunsteiner's citizenship in 1968 on the grounds that she had not disclosed her war crime conviction, but in 1971, a deal was struck that would avoid her extradition, as by this point, she was eligible to become naturalised, swapping her outright citizenship for a naturalised status. However, her discovery had not gone unnoticed in West Germany, with a prosecutor in Dusseldorf submitting a request for extradition in early 1973 on the grounds of her complicity in the murder of some 200,000 people. Braunsteiner was arrested in March 1973 and held in Rikers Island whilst she awaited extradition. Six months later, in August, she became the first Nazi war criminal to be extradited from the USA. She was held in Dusseldorf, awaiting trial until April of 1976, when her devoted husband was able to bail her out. However, in a complete betrayal of this trust placed in her by her spouse, she was taken back into custody in early December of 1978 on the charge of attempted witness intimidation. Her trial became part of a much greater case, with a further 15 other accused SS guards from Meidenek that began on the 26th of November 1975. This would become the longest and most expensive trial in the history of the country. Whilst insufficient evidence was found for certain aspects of her indictment, there was still enough to find her guilty overall, sentencing Braunsteiner to life imprisonment on the 30th of June 1981, the most severe sentence of the 16 defendants. She was eventually released from Mülheimer Women's Prison on compassionate grounds in 1996, following her needing one of her legs amputated due to complications from diabetes. Hermina Braunsteiner Ryan died on the 19th of April, 1999, at the age of 79. Theodor van Eupen, Camps, Treblinka 1 Sadly, no picture of van Eupen seems to exist, nor is there a great deal of information about his life, but that does not mean that he gets a pass. He was born on the 24th of April 1907 in Dusseldorf. He earned a law degree during the interwar years and had joined the SS earlier on in their existence, being given the membership number 4528. Van Eupen was the commander of the Arbeitslager at Treblinka, the labour camp. Having gained the position in mid-1941, this took the form of a pre-existing stone quarry that was commandeered for the use of the Reich for road building and concrete production, etc. The addition of barrack buildings and barbed wire fencing was all that was required to make it fit for purpose of forced labour. As far as I can tell, von Eupen had nothing to do with the more infamous extermination camp half a mile or so away, but that doesn't mean the labour camp didn't see its fair share of death. Van Eupen would take a particularly ghoulish pride in randomly shooting people with his Luger, for literally no reason at all, other than pure whim. The camp had a standing population of between one to two thousand inmates, overseen by a dozen SS and a further one hundred Travniki guards, recruited from Soviet POWs, mostly from the Ukraine. After the liquidation of both Treblinka camps in July 1944, on the 11th of December that year, Van Eupen, now aged 37, was ambushed on a road by Polish partisans near the small town of Yadirzhov. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Sorry if I didn't. Van Eupen managed to leap from his car and ran for his life all the way to the village of Lipovka, finding refuge under a haystack. Unfortunately for him, the partisans found his bolt hole and mercilessly machine-gunned it. Upon examination of the corpse, they found his identity documents and discovered who he was. No doubt a smile of satisfaction was shared all around the group of Poles. They dumped the bodies of those they killed in a nearby lake. The Germans recovered Van Eupen's body along with three others killed in the roadside ambush. They had selected a small number of local inhabitants to be shot, but they were able to convince them that the ambush was the work of Soviet paratroopers, thus saving the civilian lives. However, Swift reprisals in the form of hunting down partisans in the area was carried out in a move dubbed Aktion Schneesturm, or Operation Snowstorm. But at least we can take comfort 
in knowing that another evil bastard in the form of Theodor van Eupen did not get away with his crimes. Herbert Langer, Camp Hjomno Langer was born on the 29th of September 1909 in Meslin, Mecklenburg. Not a great deal of information is known about his early years, other than the fact that he was a failed law student and that joined the early NSDAP thug squad, the Sturmabteilung, known as the Brown Shirts, in May 1932. He only stayed in the SA for three months, moving on to the more elite SS. This was a wise move, as the next year, the Knight of the Long Knives would see the SS completely obliterate the higher command of the SA, as Hitler had become paranoid that their leader, Ernst Röhm, was plotting against him. Langer had become Deputy Police Commissioner in 1935, which would eventually lead to the next chapter of his life, and the one that would catapult him into the history books for all the wrong reasons. With the launching of the invasion of Poland in September 1939, the advancing army were followed close behind by Nazi death squads, recruited by Reinhard Heydrich from the various Reich police forces. These were known as the Einsatzgruppen, or task forces, and they will be getting a dedicated video in future. But for the purposes of exposition, all I need mention at this point is that the job of the Einsatzgruppen was to round up suspected Jews and communist sympathisers in all of the newly conquered territory that the Wehrmacht had taken. These perceived undesirables were dragged away from the settlements to a quiet place in the middle of nowhere, forced them to dig a huge trench, and then they would be shot. The mass grave covered over, and the Einsatzgruppen would move on to the next settlement. This was the first major stage of the Holocaust where murder was the outright purpose. Herbert Langer was assigned to Einsatzgruppe Zex under SS Oberführer Erich Naumann, which consisted of a total of 3,000 men operating in the Wielkopolka area of Poland and are thought to be responsible for the cold-blooded murders of at least 95,000 people. Langer himself was given command of his own section that bore his name. Langer became part of the Aktion T4 Euthanasia program when he was tasked with the liquidation of mentally ill and disabled people from the areas in which he operated. He and his squad were known to have killed at least 5,700 patients by mid-1940. The early ones were simply shot, but then someone hit upon the idea of using carbon monoxide from the exhausts of internal combustion engines to exterminate them. For this, it was decided that the most efficient way of doing this was to use special vans. The vans were modified to create an airtight seal around the rear doors and redirected their exhaust to vent directly into the former cargo space. With the conquering of Poland came further opportunity for advancement for Langa. In November of 1941, he was appointed as commandant of the new camp at Hjelmno, known to the Germans as Kulmhof, around 50 kilometres north of Lodz. Lange took it upon himself to conduct further experiments with gas vans to exterminate the inmates, but Lange wanted to greatly expand and streamline the process. During Aktion T4, the vans had been driven around for a short while, until the drivers were fairly certain that everyone was dead, mostly due to the screams having stopped for a while. But of course, this used more fuel and caused wear and tear on the vans. Langer's idea was to have the van stationary and work out a proper time for when they could be certain that those inside were dead. Short, fully enclosed wooden ramps would lead from the main building into the rear of the vans, and the door sealed behind them when they couldn't cram any more in. When the doors were finally unsealed, the dead would mostly still be stood up due to lack of room, only slumping down once the crush was relieved by the Zonderkommando, a group of inmates specially chosen from amongst the healthiest and strongest of the bunch, whose job it was to dispose of the bodies by burying them initially in mass graves, and latterly burning them in huge cremation pits. Langer would remain as commandant of the camp until April of 1942. In total, when one accounts for other deaths by disease, starvation, and, of course, summary executions, etc., the Hjomno camp 
is thought to have claimed the lives of somewhere between 152,000 to 200,000, most of whom were Jews. After Langer was relieved of command, he was recalled to Berlin to the Reich's main security office as a criminal investigator, later being transferred to the Balkans to help root out partisans. He returned briefly to Chelmno in March of 1944, long after Aktion Reinhard had officially ended in late 1943, and restarted gassing operations for a short while at the special request of the local Gauleiter, Arthur Greiser, to liquidate the last few transports of Jews from the nearby ghettos. Once this was done, Langer would go on to help round up all the conspirators of the failed plot to kill Hitler by Colonel Klaus von Stauffenberg, placing a bomb at the so-called Wolf's Lair command centre on the 20th of July 1944. Herbert Langer was killed on the 20th of April 1945, during the Battle of Berlin. He was 35 years old. Christian Wert, a.k.a. Christian the Terrible, or the Wild Christian, or Stuka. Camps, Chelmno, and Belzec. Born on the 24th of November 1885 in Oberbalsheim, Wert would become one of the chief architects of Aktion Reinhard, the so-called final solution to the Jewish question. In fact, I would go as far as to say that Wert is quite possibly the evilest Nazi you've never heard of. His father was a master cooper, that's a barrel maker. Young Christian was obviously expected to follow in his father's footsteps, learning carpentry as he grew. He joined the army between 1905 and 1910, serving in the 123rd Grenadier Regiment of Württemberg, and afterward joining the police, moving to Stuttgart. He voluntarily rejoined the army during the First World War, serving as a non-commissioned officer on the Western Front. He fought well, distinguishing himself in combat, and being awarded the Iron Cross Second and First Class, as well as the Order of the Crown, an award unique to Württemberg. After the war, he returned to Stuttgart to resume his work as a detective in 1919. Wirt got in on the ground floor with the Nazi party, joining in 1923, being later known as an Alterkämpfer, or Old Fighter, a title reserved for those who joined the party early on. He also joined the SA in late June 1933. Due to his policing background in December 1937, he applied to join the Sicherheitsdienst, or SD, who were an intelligence-gathering body in a similar vein to that of the much more widely known, yet much smaller and specialised Geheime Staatspolizei, or Gestapo. He later transferred from the SA to the SS in August 1939, a little later than most top Nazis. Wirt became involved with Aktion T4 at the end of 1939, along with other fellow police detectives. They were posted to the small number of specialised killing centres to dispose of the lesser-known victims of the Nazi regime, the mentally ill and disabled. He was also present to witness the first experiments of gassing using carbon monoxide and became the chief overseer of the Hartheim facility, personally directing his staff to murder the, quote, patients who had been selected, also diligently keeping the paperwork up to date. Later, with the beginning of Aktion Reinhardt, Odilo Globochnik, who was in nominal charge of the implementation of the final solution, approached Wirt and offered him the job of commandant of the new death camp at Belzec, which began gassing operations in March 1942. Another SS member, Erik Fuchs, who accompanied Wirt during both Aktion T4 and at Belzec, said of him, Polizeihauptmann Christian Wirt conducted the Aktionen in Bernberg, Subordinate to him were the burners, disinfectors and drivers. He also supervised the transportation of the mentally ill and of the corpses. One day in the winter of 1941, Wirt arranged a transport of euthanasia personnel to Poland. I was picked together with about eight or ten other men and transferred to Belzec. I don't remember the names of the others. Upon our arrival at Belzec, we met Friedel Schwartz, and other SS men, whose names I cannot remember. They supervised the construction of the barracks that would serve as a gas chamber. Wirt told us that in Berzec, quote, all the Jews would be struck down. 
For this purpose, barracks were built as gas chambers. I installed shower heads in the gas chambers. The nozzles were not connected to any water pipes. They would serve as a camouflage for the gas chamber. For the Jews who were guessed, it would seem as if they were being taken to the baths for disinfection. Wirth's ruthless efficiency was such that he would be given overall command of Treblinka and Sobibor as well, making their commandants directly answerable to him, effectively becoming Globochnik's right-hand man. Following the successful rebellion at Sobibor on October 14, 1943, in an operation named Aktion Erntefest, or Harvest Festival, the entirety of the inmates of the camps of Travniki, Ponyatova, and Maitnek were summarily shot as reprisals, around 42,000 people in total. Of course, it wasn't long before new inmates arrived at these camps. Following the termination of Aktion Reinhard in late 1943, the majority of the remaining camp staff with Wert in command were sent to Trieste in Italy to conduct anti-partisan operations. Later, Wert would be sent to Yugoslavia to counter rebel efforts there. Rumours abound that these counter-insurgency squads were in an effort to place the former extermination camp staff in the greatest amount of danger, in the hope that they would be killed, and therefore the final witnesses would be disposed of. Given everything else the Nazis did and their concerted efforts to erase the evidence of the Reinhardt camps, I wouldn't put this past them. SS Unterscharführer Franz Suchommel said of Wirt at his own trial, For my activity in the camps at Treblinka and Sobibor, I remember that Wirt, in brutality, meanness and ruthlessness, could not be surpassed. We therefore called him Christian the Terrible, or the Wild Christian. The Ukrainian guardsmen called him Stuka. The brutality of Wirt was so great that I personally see it as a perversity. I remember particularly that on each occasion Wirt lashed Ukrainian guardsmen with the whip he always kept. If only someone had had the courage to kill Christian Wirt, then Aktion Reinhardt would have collapsed. Berlin would have not have found another man with such energy for evil and nastiness. Another infamous SS man, Franz Stangl, commandant of Sobibor and Treblinka, and covered in part one of this series, described Christian Wirt and his cold indifference to the victims of Aktion Reinhardt during a 1971 interview. Wirt was a gross and florid man. My heart sank when I met him. I stayed at Hartheim for several days that time and often came back. Whenever he was there, he addressed us daily at lunch. And here it was again this awful verbal crudity. When he spoke about the necessity of the euthanasia operation, he was not speaking in humane and scientific terms, the way Dr. Werner at T4 had described it to me. He laughed. He spoke of doing away with useless mouths, and that sentimental slobber about such people made him puke. To tell the truth, one did become used to it. They were cargo. I think it started the first day I saw the Totenlager at Treblinka. I remember Wirt standing there next to the pits full of blue-black corpses. It had nothing to do with humanity. It could not have. It was a mass grave, a mass of rotting flesh. Wirt said, What shall we do with this garbage? I think, unconsciously, that started me thinking of them as cargo. Christian Wirt was killed in an ambush by Yugoslav partisans on the 26th of May, 1944, near Kosnia. He was 58 years old. Oskar Gröning, a.k.a. The Accountant Camp Auschwitz Oskar Gröning is a name that came to prominence in the modern day. Whilst, as far as we can tell, he did not take an active part in the maltreatment of prisoners, he most certainly did play an instrumental role in the ancillary tasks of the concentration camp system. Gröning was the accountant of Auschwitz, responsible for counting and valuing the many millions of various currencies and valuables looted from the camp inmates. Day after day, Gröning would handle insane amounts of money, precious metals and stones. 
he would package it all up and sent it back to the Reich's main security office in Berlin. Through his hands passed many millions in almost any currency imaginable, from rubles to US dollars and even British pounds. At one point, many of the Auschwitz guards were all suspected of stealing monies from the camp inmates for themselves, instead of sending it back to Berlin. All the suspects had their lockers sealed with tape, until such a time as they could be inspected. Gröning was able to get away with his own little stash of loot by simply removing the back of his locker when no one was about, removing the evidence, and hiding it elsewhere. Sniggy sniggy, sir. He was convicted of being an accessory to 300,000 counts of murder, yet, strangely, he was only sentenced to four years' imprisonment. Gröning was the subject of a documentary outlining his activities at the infamous camp. Throughout the in-depth interviews with him, Groening was completely candid about his role and entirely unrepentant about his actions. He did confess to enriching himself from the proceeds of the camp, but claimed that practically everyone did. In an interesting aside, despite his attempts to limit the extent of his own involvement, Groening was very vocal in his opinions about those who pathetically attempted to deny the Holocaust ever happened. He has rubbished claims of denial by saying variously, I saw everything. The guest chambers, the cremations, the selection process. One and a half million Jews were murdered in Auschwitz. I was there. I would like you to believe me. I saw the guest chambers. I saw the crematoria. I saw the open fires. I would like you to believe that these atrocities happened because I was there. Oskar Gröning died on the 9th of March 2018 at the age of 96. A free man. Josef Rudolf Mengele, a.k.a. the Angel of Death, Camp Auschwitz-Birkenau. Of course, we must cover perhaps the evilest one of all, the one they call Dr. Death. Josef Mengele was born on the 16th of March 1911 in Gunzburg, Bavaria, to a successful family that sold farming machinery. Young Josef did very well at school, doing particularly well in music and art, graduating high school in 1930, then moved to Munich to study philosophy and anthropology, earning his PhD in the latter topic in 1935. In 1937, he had also joined the Nazi party, becoming enthralled in the part of their ideology that went all in on the in-vogue philosophy of eugenics, the warped and immoral idea that perceived genetic defects can be bred out by only allowing those considered pure to breed, and by extension, the mass euthanasia of those perceived as impure. He became fascinated with genetics, with a particular interest in the study of twins, as well as factors that resulted in certain physical birth defects, such as a cleft palate and so-called hair lip. He based his thesis on this subject, earning him his MD title with honours from the University of Frankfurt in 1938. Mengele joined the Wehrmacht in 1940, but soon applied to join the Waffen-SS. By this time, he was already an SS member. He was posted to the Ostfront as part of Army Group South that pushed into the Ukraine. He was attached to the 5th SS Panzer Division as a medical officer, being awarded the Iron Cross Second Class. He achieved the first class award for his heroic actions, saving two men by dragging them from a tank that was ablaze. After a couple of injuries, he was honourably discharged from the front in the summer of 1942, deemed no longer medically fit for service. He briefly returned to Germany to resume his medical research studies, but this would not last long, as fate had other ideas for Dr. Mengele. His longtime mentor, Ottmar von Verscheuer, encouraged him to apply to the concentration camp system. With Mengele's excellent resume, he was quickly accepted and posted to Auschwitz-Birkenau in Poland. Here, he was part of the team with the job of the daily selections from the incoming transport. All of those that were fit and healthy enough to work were assigned to one of the various labour details, whilst those that were not able to work were instantly sent to the nearby crematoria to be liquidated. Or, you know, murdered. Mengele would sift the crowd very carefully for the ones that he would become infamously associated with. Twins, particularly children, 
Any sets of identical siblings that were found were set aside, especially for his own purposes. He particularly relished the prospect of selections, completely the opposite reaction to the other medical staff of the camp, who considered it the worst part of their duties. Mengele oversaw the camp infirmary. Any inmate who did not recover within a few days would either be killed by a lethal injection or carted off to the gas chambers. When it came to the children, this was where Mengele showed his insidious side. Often arriving with sweets and chocolate for them, much to their delight, they were encouraged to refer to him as Uncle Yosef and would crowd round him to get their treats. However, once these faux niceties were dispensed with, he would get down to the real reason as to why he had selected them. Each set of twins would be experimented upon with a wide array of horrific medical trials. These would involve such grisly things as infecting both twins with various deadly pathogens, observing the effects and progression in each of them. If one died before the other, the surviving twin would be immediately killed and both dissected side by side to observe the internal differences. Others would have their blood transfused into their twin to see if it had any effect. Unnecessary amputations were also routine, usually without anaesthesia. He had a particularly ghoulish fascination with eye colour, attempting to change the colour of the iris by injecting them with various chemicals, a thought which sends the shiver down the spine of yours truly. He would also remove various internal organs to see how long they could survive without them, such as kidneys, liver and even stomach. One man, Itzhak Ganon, had one of his kidneys removed, but as soon as he came round from the anaesthesia, he was forced to return to work with no pain relief. In another disgraceful act, he attempted to create conjoined twins by sewing a set of Romani twins back to back. After several days of suffering, both died of gangrene. The results of these experiments would be sent back to his old mentor, von Verscheuer, along with preserved specimens, with the intention of proving the superiority of the Germanic Aryan race. One of his former Auschwitz medical colleagues described Mengele thusly, He was capable of being so kind to children, to have them become fond of him, to bring them sugar, to think of small details in their daily lives, and to do things we would genuinely admire. And then, next to that, the crematoria smoke, and these children, tomorrow, or in half an hour, he is going to send them there. Well, that is where the anomaly lay. Following the end of the war, the now fugitive Mengele, although having been captured by the US forces in June 1945, was not identified as a wanted man due to the chaos immediately following the cessation of hostilities and consolidation of positions. Mengele had taken to wearing a standard Wehrmacht officer uniform rather than his SS one, which would have instantly marked him out. Although, unlike other SS men, he did not have his blood type tattooed under his upper arm. Another factor that kept him off the radar of the Allies, who unknowingly released him in July of 1945. He quickly obtained false ID papers under the name Fritz Ullmann, and spent several months working at a farm in Soviet-occupied territory. This he did in an effort to recover what remained of his old Auschwitz paperwork, including some of his experiment reports and specimens. After this, he travelled to Genoa in Italy, and with a new ID obtained through the Red Cross, under the new pseudonym of Helmut Gregor, he was able to gain passage to South America, landing in the sympathetic country of Argentina in 1949. His wife, Irena, refused to go with him. Eventually, the pair would be granted a divorce in 1958, with Josef remarrying that same year to another German expat woman called Marta. There had been various reported sightings of people who were thought to have been Mengele, coming in from all over the world, from the Mediterranean to the Americas. Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal was adamant that Mengele was still alive, but sadly, never able to track him down. Mengele was the top of the Nazi hunter's most wanted list, to bring him to the justice that he so richly deserved was seen as vital to the quest for righting the wrongs of the Shoah. Mengele became something of a mysterious and ethereal figure, similar to that of the early 1970s British playboy and murder suspect John Bingham, the Lord Lucan. Lots of potential sightings, but never conclusively found. Finally, in 1985, 
All signs pointed toward an unassuming grave all the way across the world near Sao Paulo, Brazil. The headstone said Wolfgang Gerhardt, but there was strong evidence to suggest that it was in fact the final resting place of the Angel of Death. The remains were exhumed on the 6th of June 1985 by the Brazilian authorities. Mengele's son Rolf confirmed in a statement that it was indeed the grave of his father. DNA tests later proved this beyond doubt. They had found the monster, but fate had already taken him beyond the clutches of final justice. Mengele had been living his life of relative safety in Brazil under an assumed name. In 1969, the real Wolfgang Gerhardt decided to return to Germany, but before he left, he gave his ID card to Mengele. This would serve as his last pseudonym that he would use. Rolf Mengele saw his father for the last time in 1977, later reporting that his father was completely unrepentant for his crimes and that he was just doing his duty as ordered, even having the brass neck to claim that he had never harmed anyone. The end came for Mengele whilst swimming in the pool of his friends, the Bossert family, in Bertioga. He suffered a massive stroke and was unable to get himself out of the water, drowning before anyone could get him out. Legacy Once again, we have seen just how normal, everyday people can have their morality completely turned on its head, making it easy to convince them to commit some of the worst atrocities in all of human history. The interwar years were an unprecedented time in Germany. The entire country was in a constant state of anarchy and chaos, with constant changes in government, hyperinflation and attempted coups. This, coupled with the deep feelings of humiliation and betrayal left over from the end of the First World War, and it becomes fairly obvious that many Germans were only too ready to listen and to follow someone who affirmed their feelings and offered solutions to raise Germany up from the pits to the peak of glory once more. But of course, we all know how that turned out. In the present, and for the future, we must take the greatest of care to ensure that tyrants do not rise to the point of no return. We have the responsibility to give our children the tools to do so. We cannot risk anything like this happening again. If this is the legacy of our generation, I consider that a noble cause. It is easier to fool people than convince them that they have been fooled. Mark Twain Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting and informative. If you did, please smash the old like button and let the internet gods hear my prayer and push the video out to a wider audience. Also, why not consider sharing it with someone you know who is interested in these kinds of topics? It really doesn't take all that long at all. Check out my back catalogue to see some more videos just like this on a wide variety of dark topics. Follow us on Facebook too, link in the description. What do you think of the people we have covered today? Is there anyone I've missed so far in this two-part mini-series? Let me know in the comments and perhaps a part three can be done. I always like to read the comments and chat to all of you lovely people. And if you can't get enough of my smooth, buttery voice, head on over to my alternate channel, DID Reads, where I post my, my own renditions of famous poetry and speeches, etc. If you wish to do so, you can now support DID on Patreon, link in the description, or if you'd prefer to go down the one-off donation route, you can hit the Super Thanks button. Or better yet, swing by the DID merch store on Teespring and pick yourself up some sweet swag. A huge thank you to all of you who have contributed so far. You guys are awesome, and I appreciate you more than words can say. In the meantime, take care of yourselves, and I shall see you on our next descent into darkness.